Now, today we are thinking in all seriousness about this topic of uh, identity. And um, it's probably one of the most profound questions we could ever ask in life is, who am I? And uh, what is my identity? And in our, our modern Western culture, when we use the word identity, we normally mean at least two things. We mean, first of all, a sense of self, but also a sense of worth. And uh, so the question really is whether you're a mum or a dad or a, a daughter or a son or you go to school, you're employed or you're retired or whatever you do in life, wherever you go, whatever your roles are through the week, who is the real you that you take into every one of those different situations? Who are you? And I don't need to persuade you, I don't think that it's such a, a topic in our society today. There, it's such a big issue. Every day on social media, through political decisions that are made, through pressure lobby groups, there is debate, there's confusion, there's anxiety, there's division, there's just plain meanness as people are being cancelled and dropped because of their views on what it means to be a human being. Who am I? And really today my aim is not to add heat but light. Because we're going to ha have a listen now to a perspective that, that I'm pretty persuaded is most often forgotten in our culture today. Sometimes even in the church. And our Bible reading that Ali will bring in a moment is fresh. Because it has something profound to say about what it means to be a person. And if it's true, it has the power to radically change the way you see yourself, the way you relate to other people. It has the power to change your hopes, your fears, your securities, and your future. So have I got your attention? So we're going to grab our Bibles. Ali's going to come up, and we're going to read from John chapter 1. 1 to 14. Thank you, Ali. 463, John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word <coughs> was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Ali, thank you very much indeed. Three aspects from that really majestic reading about this topic of identity, a fresh perspective, the true you. And here's the first one, a true place to begin. Now, this reading, 1 to 14 in John's Gospel, is really an introduction to what he wants to say about Jesus, but he's not writing a thesis on modern identity formation. So we can't sort of impose the topic onto the passage 
And yet it is so very striking what it says immediately into this topic. Because just look where he starts. If you look down with me at verse 1, the first three words, in the beginning. The word beginning is a Greek word. It's, the word is arche, and it really means origins or source. So think of, you know, archaeology, which is what? The study of digging up dead original things. I'm sure it's more complicated than that, so apologies if you're an archaeologist. But uh, it's striking, isn't it? Because when it comes to identity, where do we normally begin? We've got to begin somewhere. Remember the song that, that I love, or loathe, uh, um, from Frozen 2? It's time to see what I can do. No rights, no wrongs, no rules for me. I'm free. And in the film, the character is Elsa. And she's discovering her powers that she can freeze, uh, basically, the world and cause the death of countless people. Uh, and who cares? Because she looks amazing. We're all singing along to the tune, even while she massacres the entire planet. And the modern secular view of identity always begins inside. The journey begins in me. I am the source. I am the original. Uh, I am the one who decides what is true, who I am. There's no absolute truth outside of me. It's all in here with me. Therefore, I'm my own validator. I don't need anyone to tell me, uh, to, to give me worth, because I'm free. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Western individualism. And all of us have heard it, and some of us, particularly on the age of 40, feel its force, hear its message in all kinds of ways every single day. There'll be others among us this morning who begin in a very different place. It might be that we've come from a more traditional uh, shape, an identity shape. It might be that, that we've grown up believing there are certain morals outside of myself. There is a kind of standard and the expectation from my family or, or from my community or from my people is that I surrender myself to those and as I give myself and serve my people or my family or my community, then they give me a sense of honor and they give me a sense that I'm worth something when I live up to their expectations. The point is that wherever you begin as you begin to think about who am I as an individual, none of us begins where John does. He begins in the beginning. And that is fresh. He's pulling us really out of the bubble of our own self-preoccupation and busyness. And he's saying, look, I'm taking you back to the very start of the universe, to the spark of the cosmos, and that our lives and our cultures today are only a tiny chapter in a vast story that spans back. And I want to take you to that beginning. And I want you to notice who it starts with. And it's not you, and it's not me. Verses 1 to 2, look down with me again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So the Bible explains that God has always existed, that he never had a beginning and will never had an end. He is the eternal God. And in Genesis 1, which really mirrors in many ways this first chapter of John, he speaks his word of life and light. And all darkness and chaos is driven away and transformed. And he creates this complex and gorgeous world that we live in. Don't you love this world in many ways? And when he speaks... He always reveals his character. If we chatted off over coffee afterwards and you spoke to me, you don't have to, if you did, I would learn something about you. When God speaks, he reveals himself, his goodness, his holiness, his majesty, his wisdom. But get your mind around this. The word is actually a person who was with God and was God. Who's John talking about? Just glance down with me, please. Verse 18. No one, here's the first hint. No one has ever seen God, but 
the one and only Son who himself is God and his closest relationship with the Father has made him known. This word is God's Son. I mean, it blows my mind when I read on in John 17 and Jesus says, Father, you've loved me from before the creation of the world. That is a mind-blowing perspective. Far from being some old, crusty, distant dictator in the sky, we're being shown that, that for all eternity, the Father's poured out his love for his Son, the Son for his Father, and is bound up in the joyful trinity, uh, fellowship of the Trinity. One writer said that, that God's love is... It makes atom bombs look like little firecrackers. And out of this love and through his word, God made all things. Verse 3, through him all things were made. Nothing was made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And the Bible loves to relish in that fact. Psalm 19, the skies declare the glory of God. Job 38 while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. So when you see a sunset going down or a sunrise sunrise coming up or you smell that fresh cut grass or you see a gorgeous ancient tree, nature creation is singing, telling you. You know, yesterday a, a post lady, I think that's the right phrase now, knocked on my door and delivered some letters. And our dog, Alfie, who is always really over the top when anyone comes to the door, ran out. He was so happy, carrying a little stick in his mouth. And when he's happy, it's not just his tail that wags. His whole body goes into this kind of weird, rhythmic thing. And he wriggles. He wriggles around. And she said, oh! She said, I wish I could be like that. I thought, hang on. You, you sure? What she meant was, I, I wish I could be joyful like that. We could learn a lot from these dogs, couldn't we, she said. And all that Alfie, my dog, is doing, he's expressing the joy of being alive. And we have more reason. Because most beautifully, please look with me at verse 4. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Isn't that amazing? So often we are told that we're no different to dogs or grains of sand, or at all we are are just more complex organisms. Well, yes, we are. And the world can be measured, measured mathematically, biologically. Of course it can, and wonderfully so. But what we're seeing here is what we already feel innately within ourselves, that we are more than that. We're made in God's image. We're made, the Bible says, that means different things, but predominantly for relationships. Not just with one another, but primarily with him, to know and love him and enjoy him. And this is where true human identity begins. The innate value of you as an individual, uh, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your age, regardless of your gender, we are precious in God's sight. We have dignity and value because he made us. Psalm 139, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. What a thought. And through his word, God weaves bonds of love into his world. It's a profound beginning. But why doesn't the world seem that way? Why do we fail so much to value one another? Why is there so much racism and sexism? Why is there so much abuse? Why are three people cut down this week in Nottingham? Why do we hurt the people around us that we say we love? Why do we use people because of what they can give us instead of actually caring for them? We must take the next step because the true place begins to begin, leads on to our second thought today. After that, come up. The true identity crisis. 
Now, what John does in these next verses is he takes the camera lens and he narrows it right down to one place and one time in history. And it's all about the promise that God made all the way through the Old Testament, through his word, that he himself would come to the world. And so we read most staggeringly in verse 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And uh, so what John wants to say to us is, look, this story I'm about to tell you of Jesus is actually the arrival of God's Son. It's the arrival of the one through whom everything was made. You need to log that into your mind. And straight away, we're into a crisis. Look down with me at verse 10. Did you notice this as it was read? He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Isn't that staggering? I mean, in my life, I've met a lot of people who do not feel recognized, who don't feel they matter very much, who don't feel they've had a voice, who feel rejected. And yet this rejection is on a different scale altogether. This is a cosmic re uh, rejection. Read Jesus' life. Everything pointed to who he was, his true identity, the Son of God, a miraculous birth, a perfect life, a revolutionary love, a care for the marginalized, a unique teaching that's changed civilization, power to heal the sick, to calm a storm, to raise the dead. He claimed to have come from his Father in heaven. He acted with God's authority, and yet he wasn't received. Herod tried to murder him as a child. His village kicked him out. The religious establishment plotted his death. His friend betrayed him for money. A cowardly governor sentenced him to death. He was mocked and punched and spat upon and nailed to a cross. The Son of God! And if we're honest today, many of us don't really want him. True of me growing up. No interest at all in God. It's time to see what I can do. No rights, no wrongs, no rules from me. I'm free. Is that your motto? The problem is that when we put ourselves at the very center of the universe, we cut out the light. And when we struggle to identify, uh, uh, work out our own identity, it's because we haven't recognized his identity. Because without his identity, we'll never really know who we are. And it leaves us in darkness, at least in two ways. The darkness of self. You see, if we're not getting our sense of significance and satisfaction and value from God, then we've got to find it somewhere else. And some of those other places are not wrong places, but they become ultimate places. Our parents, our career, being good academically, getting 25 A triple stars, the arts, sports, a lover. Just look inside yourself and follow your heart. But it's wrought with problems. There's a problem of significance. I found this time and again in my life. I don't know if you have. Uh, I, many of you will know Madonna. She's been around for four decades. And uh, she's changed her persona countless times, again and again and again, changed her identity and image. And she was once interviewed in a, a Vogue magazine. She said this, my drive in life from the fear is from the fear of being mediocre. I push out to be a special human being, but when I feel, but then I feel I'm still mediocre and I'm just uninteresting until I become someone else. And even if I become someone else, I have to then prove that I'm somebody. And I don't think it's ever going to end. When my dad died, I spent about a year dressing like my dad. I put on his old suits, greased back my hair, put a monocle in my eye, I'm really joking. 
It's because when he was gone, I was lost because my identity was wrapped up in him. Who am I? When we lose someone, that can happen. It's not secure. And it's inconsistent. I mean, isn't this a truth? The person you are today, sorry, the, the person you were 10 years ago is, if you look back on that person, you think, that person was so silly. If you're 15, you look back to when you're five and you say, I was so stupid, wasn't I? Look what I did. When you're 25, you look back to when you're 15, you say, what did I know? I was so silly. And when you're 60, you look back to when you were 50, you think, I thought I was old, come on. How silly was I? And guess what? That means your future self is going to say, what about you now? I'm just silly. The Christian writer Lewis Smeads famously writes, my wife has lived with at least five different men since we were wed, and each of the five has been me. So we're going through all these cycles of life, teen years, the 20s, the 30s, the midlife crisis, the older retired years. Who am I? And there's the problem of pressure. Some of us have grown up and uh, we, we feel that what we need more than anything else is just more validation. And, and we look for it in a relationship with someone and hope that love partner will, will give us security and everything that we need. And we put so much pressure, a pressure that like, they cannot bear. It's a burden. Or perhaps you feel you haven't succeeded enough in life. And so we, we put all our dreams on our kids and hope that our kids would live out the, our own inadequacies. And it's pressure. And it's crushing. Now, these are our identity confusions. And it's so fragile. Because if you live for your career, what are you going to do when it's gone? And if you live for your partner, and I've, you know, I've been married for 27 years, and what a wonderful thing that is. But I know that one day it has to finish. And so often when that happens, we begin to feel like we're back at square one. Who am I? I know it's hard to hear this. But when we keep God out, it's, it's difficult to work out who we are. And it's not just the, the darkness of self, it's the darkness of, of God's justice. Because one day he's going to come back to this earth that he's made. Because he's good and faithful and perfect, and he's going to make it right. And he's going to remove all that is evil. And we're going to have to stand, each of us, before him and tell him why we've treated him and his world the way we have. And our sins are serious. And if we don't want this God in life, then we won't have him in eternity. The place the Bible calls hell. Now, this, there is, of course, hope. Because that's why Jesus came in the first place. If we, I'm going to move on to the third and final point here, a bit more briefly, but let's look at this together. Light in the darkness, the true you received, not achieved. Look down with me, please, at verse 12. Verse 12. Yet, don't you love that word, yet? Yet. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Just think about that. You know, it, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? That the God who spoke light out of darkness came to bring us out of the darkness of life without him into a relationship that we could never think of. It's easy, isn't it, to think of God as a sort of lucky charm that you call out to when things aren't going too well in life. Or maybe a bit of a bully, because he doesn't give you an easy life. But what the Bible is saying, he's actually, as you come to him, he wants you to become his child. A relationship in which we find our true selves. And I want you to notice how, how radical and supernatural this is. Just look at verse 13. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. The family of God has nothing to do with your heritage. 
It has nothing to do with your family name or where you were born or how good you think you are or how worthy you think you are. It's not a relationship we can just walk into. It can't be achieved. It must be received. And the basis for that is what the Bible calls grace. You see verse 14, he came full of grace and truth. Now let me tell you, tell you a very short story. During the Rwandan genocide in the 90s, uh, a story is told of a lady called Adele and her husband who was a pastor of a church. And their entire village were taken into the, the village church and then macheted to death by the Hutu rebels. But after three days, Adele was found alive under bodies, barely breathing. It took years of surgery to get over her horrific injuries. After the genocide, Adele, as a Christian, decided that instead of growing bitter and angry, she would go into the prisons and serve the, uh, the, the, the rebels. And she took soap and food and towels. And one day, a man fell at her feet, weeping, saying, do you remember me? And it was the man who cut her husband's throat and tried to murder her, and he's pleading for forgiveness. And for six months, Adele went and visited him and shared the gospel with him, read the Bible with him, and his name was Lewis. And when Lewis came out of prison with no prospects, no money, no home, nothing, Adele adopted him and took him under her roof as her son. And that is grace. It's a relationship that you could never earn or pay for or achieve. It must be received. But what does it mean to be born of God? It means a new heart. We haven't got time to go into this now. But later on in John chapter 3, Jesus explains that, that he must change our hearts, the people we are on the inside with water and spirit. We must be cleansed, forgiven, and the heart needs to be made new and changed. But only God can do that. And it happens, we hear down here very clearly, when we receive him, when we believe in his name. John goes on to write these beautiful words. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And this is what we need to realize, dear friends. Did you see that the father from the Nottingham, um, one of the students who was killed up in Nottingham, and, uh, you know, very emotionally saying, you know, my baby boy. You know, and, and what would he give to have his son back. And what does God give to have us back? He gives himself. And on the cross, Jesus willingly gives himself. He takes the punishment that should be ours. He pays the, birth, he pays the price of our sin and guilt. He takes our darkness as... God's wrath has poured on him instead of us. So we might be forgiven. So our hearts might be forgiven. And he rises from the grave to demonstrate that that is enough. That sin and death are dealt with. And we may come home to our Heavenly Father. This is a supernatural thing. We can't do this ourselves. But it's fresh. So when we ask the question, who am I? The Christian answer really ought to be a child of God. That is who I am. Not because I say so, but because he gives me the right to say that. And it changes everything. It means a wonderful new relationship with him. You see, Christianity is not a cult. You're not being asked to believe in something just because your parents do. But a vibrant relationship with a God who gave himself for you. 
to know him personally and to enjoy him through life. It's a true relationship. It's a true security. You know, whatever people say about you in life, however they evaluate you, however friend, many friends you've got, how many followers you've got on whatever it is, TikTok, what's the other thing? Whatever the other thing is. What is it? Whatever it is. However you're treated, God knows. And what matters most is his opinion of you. And he calls you his child. And if we forget this, and we just allow other people's opinions to shape us far too much, then we're always going to wobble. But he's called you his child, and nothing can change that. And it's not childish. I love this little quote from C.S. Lewis. God wants children's hearts and grown-ups' heads. He wants you to grow up in this relationship and mature and stand in the strength that he has given you. And it gives us a true future. Do you remember what Jesus said to his troubled disciples? I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And so he sent his spirit to live in us, to confirm that we are his children and to make us look forward to our future. And whatever stage of life we go through as a Christian, whatever sadnesses, whatever lonelinesses, whatever complexities we face, we are the children of God and we have a future. A family friend of ours called Sandra died recently. She succumbed to 10 years battling breast cancer. It was a privilege running a Christian Explored course where she attended and she recognized Jesus, his identity. And she felt the warmth of God's fatherly love. She trusted him. And then I explained to her that, look, Sandra, following Jesus is not going to take all your problems away. And she said this, which is never, I've never forgotten. I know. I don't expect God to heal me. It is enough to be loved. And so I finish with her favorite Bible verse. Sorry to be a bit emotional. But these are great truths. Let me finish with a favorite Bible verse. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first earth, heaven, the first earth had passed away. There's no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among his people, and he will dwell with them. He will be their people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. That's what God does for his children. And I hope that helps you this morning. And I hope it doesn't drive you away in fear, but to consider his gift, which he holds out for you in this world that is so confused. I pray you may trust him for yourself. Shall I pray? Lord, it's a majestic part of your word that we've read. Hard to really do justice to its magnitude, but thank you so much that we can at least grasp that you made us with great dignity and value and that you sent your son to die for us so we might not only be loved creatures, but that we might become beloved children. And we pray that we might rejoice in that and find in you the true us, children of God. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for his death. And thank you for the future you've given us in him. In Jesus' name. Amen.